I work for Move It, and uh, that's where Uruguay is. Um, I've surprisingly, to, to my uh, yeah, to my surprise, I found out that a lot of people actually know where it is, and that's cool. We're like a small country which, between Brazil and Argentina. Um, to give you an idea of size, Brazil is a little bigger than the contiguous U.S. Um, Argentina is about four times the size of Texas, and and Uruguay is actually about the size of Missouri, which I find kind of cool. We just have like half the population, but otherwise it's kind of the same. Um, and one, like, one thing that really distinguishes us is that uh, Uruguay has the highest level of, uh, or on average, like per capita, we have the, the more uh, software export in, in South America, which is pretty cool. So there's a lot of uh, software going on in, in Uruguay. Um, we love barbecue, which in, in, in Uruguay we call asado, and it's kind of popular, I guess, everywhere. I love that the barbecue is actually a thing in Kansas City. I hope to try some out, and uh, well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, we love to drink mate. If you think coffee in the US, that's what mate is like in Uruguay. It's kind of like green tea, but not really. It's, it's, not, it's not the same leaf, it's a different one. But uh, it does like it, it is like an energy drink, if you will. And the other thing that we love is soccer. And I, I hear that some of you recognize him. This is this is one of the one of the best players right now. And uh, yeah, we 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 love him and it's and sometimes hate him for the things he does on the pitch. But you know, we're all humans. Anyway, so excellence through diversity. Um, I want to start with humankind. Uh, what, what can we say about humankind? Um, I think one of the things that, that really defines or, you know, you can say about humankind is that we're great. We, uh, throughout history, we, we have uh, accomplished many great things, buildings, and uh, Still today, the advancement in technology, especially in, in, in the last century, it's like, it's crazy how much we, we have accomplished. Um, but also, one of the other things that, that we are is we're very different from, from each other. Um, we have different you know, backgrounds, different upbringings, different culture. Um, there, there, there are a lot of different things. And all of this contributes um, to us having different perspectives um, on, on almost a, any topic. I, I'm sure that there's like, uh, you know, you can have a discussion on almost anything. And, and, and we've been known, I mean, humans have been known to pick a fight on, a, on like the weirdest topics that you wouldn't believe. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, today I want to show you kind of a different take on, on this pr perspective thing. And it kind of has to do with, with my story, with uh, um, yeah, something that, that is uh, kind of a part of me. Who can see something on there? Cool. What, what's, what's on there? An eight? That's cool. Who's seeing a three? Someone said three? Does someone not see anything? You see Batman. Okay. <laughs> That's not the answer I was expecting, but cool. So, yeah. So this is actually called the Ishihara test, and it's for colorblind people. Yeah. It kind of tests if you're colorblind in, in some way. And so people that are, not, that are usually not colorblind see, see an 8. Um, if you are like colorblind like me, you see a 3. And some other colorblindness may, may render that you don't see anything recognize anything. Um, next one. Who sees anything here? Come on, anyone has to? Yeah? Sorry, but no. <laughs> Come on. Yes, what do you see? Oh, not exactly. 
No, there's no number around there. Okay. I thought I thought some of some some would see it, but there's actually a no in there. You wouldn't believe it. M maybe you see it now. Now that you know to look for it. Yeah. Okay. So colorblind people will see that no. Like it's like screaming in, in my eyes, but of course it's not yours. So we're different, right? And we have a very different perspective on what we recognize there or don't recognize there. And, uh, and so I wanna, so my, my question with this is, like, which one is, is actually true? Is there an O or is it not an O? Is there an eight, is there a three? Which one, which one is true? Um, I'll leave you with that hanging for, for a while. Uh, this actually, this, as you can uh, guess, I, um, bring some challenges with it. Um, and uh, one, one of the challenges is with food. Uh, when I was growing up, like, um, I was having a really hard time knowing if a fruit was ripe or wasn't ripe. I would be like, um, you know, eating one, and whoa, this is really sweet and, you know, nice. And the other one would be like, oh, this, this really doesn't taste good. And, you know, visually, I wouldn't have a clue about what I was doing wrong. So, so my mind kind of started adapting and, and, you know, looking for different things. For example, if I want to know if a banana is ripe, I start looking for the black spots. Yeah, it's, it's probably maybe overripe, but yeah, um, that's one of, one of the things that you need to look for. Or the, the texture of the fruit. I always like when I'm at the grocery store, I have to touch them to know if, you know, they're ripe or they're really, really green. <clears throat> Also one with meat, and here you can see the difference. Um, like I said, we love barbecue. I, I like barbecue, I like to cook. And, uh, and I, I, I didn't know it before, but when I discovered that I was colorblind, I said, yeah, no wonder you have a hard time knowing if the, if the meat is cooked or not, <clears throat> if it's done or... or um, and the other one is clothing. Um, Imagine it's St. Patrick's and you show up at work, yes, all green, and no, you're red. <laughs> I actually, I never did it. I'm, I'm married and I, I asked my wife for advice, advice so, uh, you know. The other one is skin color changes. Um, it's really hard for me to tell if, uh, if I'm sunburned, like, uh, or I can tell when it's really late, like, dude, you're burning out. And uh, the other one is, and this can lead sometimes into some social, awkward social encounters is, I have a hard time seeing if a person turns pale or, or they're like red, like they're blood into the face, because, uh, and, and that's like, I, I may not notice if I'm embarrassing someone or maybe they're sick or stuff like that, and, and yeah, so you need to be careful there. And the last one is board games, and this is actually how I kind of discovered that I was colorblind. I didn't know I was colorblind until I was like 21 years old. That's kind of crazy. Um, and uh, we were playing cards, you know, uh, there were like six colors, and uh, I think they were playing red, and I like, I threw my card, I thought I was thro throwing the same card they were, they, that was going on, and uh, um, a friend who actually is my wife now said, you don't have any, any, any red anymore? I'm like, why, what are we playing? Well, you threw, a, uh, we're playing red, and what did I throw? You threw a green card. I'm like, really? And then I'm like, they look into my cards and see, oh, you got a red thread over there, and, and they say, you're colorblind. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then they're like, yes, you are. <laughs> and yeah, finally, so yeah, you're colorblind. And uh, anyway, but not, not, everything, uh, not everything is so, you know, uh, challenging. So th there are also some interesting uh, things that, that give you an edge. We apparently have better night vision. Uh, there's a scientific reason for this. If you want to know more about it, I don't want to get into it. Can, you can uh, talk me up later. Um, and the military have been known to, to use colorblind people for uh, th seeing through camouflage because they're not uh, confused by the same color uh, patterns. And uh, yeah, I think they now have like technology that, that does that for them, but um, at some point they, they used to use that. <clears throat> so 
the point I'm kind of trying to make here is that really what happens is you, your mind starts to work differently than an artist because, uh, and why does this happen? Um, because color becomes non-deterministic. Uh, when, when, when there's something painted green or painted uh, yellow or, and it's kind of similar, I, I don't see the difference. And uh, so I'll say, someone says, well, what color is this? And I say, green? But if you tell me it's yellow, I mean, that's OK with me. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. And, and so a funny story there is like, uh, I used to live in a student's home. And one time I woke up to eat breakfast. And, like, and I, I'm like, oh, they painted the, the volleyball sticks with, with green. And, and the, my friend next to me said, yeah, especially because they're red. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, but yeah, color becomes non-deterministic. Um, and we start relying on other things, like I said, touch, touching things and uh, you know, uh, just looking for shapes maybe or other stuff and maybe um, you know, uh, just getting a different uh, angle on, on, on things. Um, and at work, of course, um, it can sometimes pose a challenge during communication. Um, just a few weeks back, a client said, okay, I want uh, this color to be tooltips, this other color to be uh, uh, pop-ups, and this other one to be uh, something else. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm trying to sort through that. And if the colors are very similar, I, I, can, I can have a hard time. And, uh, but if the other person knows that, that you have that, uh, that challenge with it or that, that, that you're different that way, uh, it can, it can be solved very easily because you just uh, color code differently. Or, for example, we like to use red to, you know, uh, signify something that we want, we think is very important, and red doesn't stand out to me. I, I thought it did, but it doesn't. Like, the other day I was driving with my wife and she's like, it's red. I'm like, where? And then, like, 100, meters, uh, 100 yards later I noticed, oh, there's a traffic light there. So I, I actually have to look for the, for the red things because they don't, pop into my eyes, other, other things are um, do. And there's also the interesting thing with design here because, like I said, we, we process the color differently and, and we, see, we see other things. When, when uh, like non colorblind people look at the design, they, they, their eyes go to the things that should like, catch their attention. And like I said, I, I don't, I don't uh, I, not the same thing catches that my attention or you know, and, and then I, I kind of tend to see other, other things there. Um, like, like I said, not, we're not so focused, focused on color maybe because it's non-deterministic to us. We're maybe more, um, more uh, focused on the contrast, on where the content is placed, and uh, the shapes of things. I really like to rely on shapes to, to identify things. So, <clears throat> but again, the communication is key here. Like, uh, if you, if in your team you, you have these differences and, uh, you know, being able to, to, to know this and to share about this is, is very important. Um, but to know each other, because if, if I don't tell anyone I'm colorblind and that I have an issue with that, I may, I may uh, you know, deal with it uh, <clears throat> sometime, but, uh, so maybe I run into trouble, or maybe I implement the wrong thing, or whatever happens. And so, so it's important to share about that. And it's important to be uh, respectful. I think that, um, like I said, uh, it can lead me into, into maybe sometimes complicated situations. Uh, but you need to be respectful about this, and, and be respectful about the different perspectives, because, OK, I may see a three or, or nothing, where other people see an eight. And I, can, I, I can't do anything about colorblindness, but sometimes I also see other things differently. And being able to discuss these things and, and do it respectfully is key to you know, bring those, those differences together and to create something better. Um, and the other one I think is very important for, for a team and, and to use communications is to, share, um, is to share your experience. Because when you're a part of a team, uh, you, you bring something very important to the table, and that is uh, all your experience, all that, all that stuff you, you did in life and, and you didn't do, and your background, and 
who you are. I think that is, um, there, there's a lot of uh, rich context in there. And when you know each other and you respect each other and you're able to share these things in a safe environment uh, you, and where you know that you know, these things will use for, for the better, you can, um, you can become a better team. Um, but the, the, the thing here is to understand that we are different. And I like the sports analogy a lot because when you, when you have a team, you actually need these differences. You don't want you know, the QB in every position. That would be terrible for the running game or the, or the, you know, the, the passing game. And um, yeah, this uh, when 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 we let these things to cause division, it can uh, when we when when we look at our differences and how we are different. If we let that cause uh, division, we, the team can break down. And as we know in sports, it's very obvious when a team doesn't click, when a team don't when they don't respect each other, when they don't want to play together. It's a mess. It's, it's like immediately. And, and I think it's in soccer, we love soccer, like I said. In soccer, you see it more, uh, you see it more just because, um, especially with strikers, when a striker is like selfish and then doesn't want to pass the ball to the other one who has like the perfect opportunity, and they're like, uh, So anyway, if, if they're constantly fighting, they, they won't create anything better. And the team, and the sum of the, of the parts of the team is actually less than, than on paper, maybe. But the, the other thing we can do, and but what I am excited about, is that if we come together and we use these differences that we have, we can actually push on the limits of what we can do. The team can be more than, than what you think they are. Like, if you evaluate each individual, uh, maybe you come up with you know, a, something in your mind, but when when you combine that and you use those differences and put them together, you can actually push on the limits of, of what you can do and you can do greater stuff. And this happens in sports too. Sometimes the underdog is like, woof, just, you know, wins. And you're like, what happened? Well, they played as a team. And, and I think that's awesome. Um, and so the question uh, that, that arises from this is like, how do we do this? How do we get a team to, to uh, to go beyond their limits. And, and I think the, the, the difference there is actually in, in, in a team. Is it a group of individuals or is it actually a team, you know? Um, because you can pick, you know, the best players in the league and put them together, but if they're not a team, they're, they're not gonna be, uh, you know, um, a great team. So, one of the things I've heard a lot lately is about hiring from the top percent. And at MoveIt, we, we, we sometimes you know, can say that too. We, we maybe hire uh, one every 30 people we interview, but I don't know. Does that mean we're hiring the top X percent? I, I think it doesn't. And it was a great blog post the other day I read. Um, I'm sorry I don't remember who it was, but it says, like, if you're hiring the top 3% of the people you interview, that, that, that's, that's what you're hiring, the top 3% of who you interview. Now, if everyone would do that, in the end, you would, you would notice that you're actually hiring from the top, maybe top 97%, not the top three. You know, you would have to like interview everyone to maybe pick the top three. But even if you did that, um, uh, you, you, it's probably an illusion. Uh, so, so we at Move It believe way more in building, actually building the team instead of, of um, just hiring the top X percent. But when you're building the team, um, you need to understand what you're looking for. And I really love the talk about um, that Joe Masti did this morning on hiring with science. Uh, if you can check that out, I mean, that's a, that's a great talk on, on, on how to take the bias out of hiring and actually going for, you know, uh, uh, really understanding what you're looking for for your team. And I think you need to understand that a team is like, like I think it is like a soccer team. You don't, wanna, you don't want a receiver, or yeah, now I'm mixing things up, but uh, a football team, you don't want a receiver everywhere. You, you, need, you need those differences. They are key to your success. 
Um, so you need to understand what you're looking for for your team, and you need to consider the team when you're hiring also. You need to understand that the, the person you're hiring will have to work with the team. So how you need to understand that. And, the, and I think the great issue here is that organizations love structure, and, and that is okay because we need structure. But uh, wh what if you, know, you put, a, put an interview in place and then you start executing it, and then it kind of becomes part of the system, but the interview is wrong, you know? And then you start just you know, hiring uh, uh, certain people, and then you start discard discarding others. And if you're not understanding what you're doing, this can like creep up on you, and suddenly you're like, oh, this is how we do it, and uh, it works great for us. You know, uh, we, we really need to, again, check out Joe Massey's talk on that. It's, it's great how, how wrong we can be sometimes about these things. And I think that, that the, really the key here is to understand that, that it's not about us. You know, when you're hiring, um, many times I've seen that the, the that the interview process kind of becomes about the, the, the guy who's interviewing or the person who is interviewing. And sometimes we, I mean, it happened to me too. When I, when I did some interviews, sometimes I just wanted to see myself in the other person. And that's like the, the worst thing you can do because it will create homogeneous teams and, and you're losing there. Um, and this is not something that I am, you know, that's grasped out, out of the air. There is a, there's a study from McKinsey that says that gender diverse teams are 15% more likely you know, to outperform other companies. That's, that's 15%. Now, there's also another study that says that ethnical diversity will get you 35%. If you sum that up, like if you have gender and ethnical diverse teams, that's just like 50% off the bat. You know? It's, it's a crazy, 50%. I mean, it, that's a lot that we're talking about here. Um, but, but one of the things that can happen real quickly, and I was talking about this with someone today, was when, when you have a diverse team that, that, that you know, works from different countries, from different places, um, many times it can be hard you know, to, to avoid chaos because uh, like I said, we're different. We communicate differently. We, sometimes we, we say things, and I've experienced this many times because, I, well, we, I'm from Uruguay, and English is not our native, native language. So sometimes we want to say something in English, and we're actually not saying what we think we're saying. We're saying something else. So, so it, is, it is important that in your team you build unity. You, and again, the sports analogy applies. You, need, uh, you want a team that's, that's uh, united, but not a team that is the same. You need to understand this. It's, it's not a homogeneous team. It's a united team. Uh, they don't think the same way. That's not unity. Thinking the same way is, is uh, you know, being homogeneous. Uh, it's not the same. And then again, communication is, is so important. Uh, when communication breaks down, that's when, when everything goes, you know, goes downwards. You need to be able to talk respectfully. Never ever uh, offend someone else. You gain nothing doing that. Absolutely nothing. You need to be able to communicate. And the buzzword here would be to communicate effectively. But what does communicating effectively really mean? Uh, I don't think that you need to, you know, just say the bare minimum. We are, you know, we're people, we, we have a lot to say, and it's not always all about work, and it's not always all about, you know, uh, we sometimes need to talk about life and, and being able to share, and I think that builds the team, that builds the trust. And uh, I think that, that two keys, and here is uh, when you're building a diverse team, there, there are two things that I strongly believe, and this is not scientific, so if I'm wrong, <laughs> uh, that's okay. But I, I, I firmly believe in this, that, that when you're building a diverse team, you need to have two things clear. You need to have, they need to share the same values, and they need to share the same goals. 
Um, why? Because the values keep the team together. And again, I know we're different, and what I'm saying here is we don't need to share everything, and that's okay. We can, we can be at work and, and share, you know, the things we care about at work. For example, I care a lot about code review. That's something I share with my, my coworkers. Um, outside of work, I may care about other things, but I don't need to bring that into the workplace. I don't need to force other opinions I have on, on my teammates because it has nothing to do with work. So what we need to understand is we, we need to find this common ground and let that keep us united and be able to, the other things that we don't share, okay, we don't share them. We don't need to fight over it. We don't need to uh, get everyone on the same boat because again, we'll, we may be losing on, on, uh, on the diversity there. And the goals are important to keep the team focused. Um, when you know where you're going, it's, it's easier to, 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 under, to understand uh, for the team to be focused, you know, to be in, because it will, um, the values will keep them together and then with the, with the focus they can go in the same direction. This will avoid the, uh, a team to, to, you know, start going into different directions and talking about things they, 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 uh, they disagree from, you know. The other day um, on a project we, I don't know, we released something and then the, the product backlog wasn't really defined so we came into work and we were just, you know, working on bugs. And that's not really fun because you, you know, you get bored and stuff. So, so it, really having those goals keeps the team focused. Um, and one of our values at MoveIt that, that we care about a lot is team over individuals. Um, we believe that the team uh, is more important, but uh, we don't dismiss individuals. Don't take this as, oh, the team goes before everything, and, and you know, if someone does something, well, the, the, something might happen. It, it's not in that sense. It's in the sense that we want team players. We want uh, people that care about the team and that they don't, you know, they don't overstep. They don't, uh, you know, they, they don't just do stuff because they think they're the star or because I'm the important one here. I was here five years before you, so you're going to do what I say. Or <laughs> my opinion is more valid because whatever. It's not, it's never about being, you know, selfish and, and just getting your opinion through what is important. The important thing is to be able to share and, and, and combine those, those different views. And I say this because I think that it's never about the stars. It's about the team. Thanks.